Philippians 2, 1 through 11. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is one of the more famous passages in Scripture. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot that we could talk about. But I'm going to just call your attention to a few different parts of this passage today. In verse 6, it says, Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. There's, we believe in a triune God. There's a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit. There's not three gods, though. There's, there's one God. One God and three persons. And Jesus is one of those persons. He's the Son of God. And so Jesus is God, as much, is God as much as the Father and the Spirit. And so in, in the song of Angels from the Realms of Glory, it says God with man is now residing in the form of God. So Jesus, Jesus is God. This is very incredible that God would become human. Something eternal would enter into time that something infinite would become finite. This doesn't make sense to us. In fact, there's all kinds of philosophers that have all these different kinds of theories about how this could possibly make sense. It's a miracle that Jesus was even born as Son of God. It'd be fascinating to discuss all that with you, but we're just going to stick with Jesus is God. He is the Son of God. He is one with God. Look at the screen here with me. What does it mean that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary? That the eternal Son of God, who is and remains true and eternal God, took to himself through the working of the Holy Spirit from the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary, a truly human nature so that he might become David's true descendant, like his brothers in every way, except for sin. So he is the eternal Son of God, but he became like us in every way, except for sin. And that's, that's actually the passage we'll be talking about tonight as well. So Jesus is God. He's God. Then verse 7. But instead of just being up there and being king of the universe and just enjoying that perfect fellowship with God the Father in heaven. He made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Jesus stooped very low to be born here. He stooped very low. Suddenly the Lord descending in his temple shall appear, it says in the hymn, the Lord descending. He had to descend pretty far to be with us. Again, infinite to finite. Timeless to being in time. All powerful to being swaddled in a manger. You know, being swaddled basically means that you're wrapped up really tightly. Back then they thought that 
babies in order to grow that you needed to wrap them up really tight, like basically kind of mummifying them like this. So when he was born, he went from being all-powerful to not even being able to move his arms. He stooped very low to be with us. And he told, tells us, shows us what being God really means. And that is, being God means giving, not grasping. He didn't hang on to what he had. He let it go. He didn't hold tight to his position, his comforts, his glories, his powers. It says he made himself nothing. Literally, it says he emptied himself. Instead of grasping, he gave. He gave. This is what it means to be God. Instead of grasping, you give. This is also what it means to be godly. Instead of grasping, you give. Instead of using your position for yourself, you use it to serve. Instead of blessing yourself, you use it to bless others. This is God. And this is also godliness. The Lord of all did not lord it over us. He did not lord it over us. He didn't use this position to just dominate us and control us, just to maintain his comforts. This is quite a contrast from human behavior, isn't it? It's just the saying, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. There's plenty of examples of that in history. When people get into positions of power, it tends to go to their head. And they tend to like being able to control things and people. Many use power to personal advantage. Many use position to come on to subordinates. We're seeing a lot of that right now, aren't we? Watch the news. Lots of high-profile people, people who are respected and in important positions, have been accused of sexual harassment. A lot of people. People use their position for personal advantage, don't they? Many use their influence to shield themselves from repercussions. So names like Matt Lauer and Harvey Weinstein and also this week Garrison Keillor. This is human nature. We use power for personal advantage. And we use power to take advantage. But this is not the way of God. And this is not what we are called to. This is not how Christ lived his life. This is not how we are called to live our lives either. Following Christ to lead is to serve. If you are a leader then make yourself a servant. It's a bit of a side point from what we're talking about today, but I think this is really important. To lead means you serve. You don't exist to bless yourself, to, be, to have advantages. If you're in a leadership position, you lead to serve. You lead to bless other people. It means you do the right thing no matter what the cost is. If you out there are, if you are the man of your house, if that's, if that's you, if you're the man of your house, then that means you're a servant. That means you don't lord it over people. That means you use that position, that authority, to bless your family, to bless your house, so that everybody thrives and flourishes. If you're leading a ministry, as a number of you are, then your goal is to advance the gospel. It's not to advance your own agenda. The goal is not to survive the program. The goal is to promote Jesus Christ. And the goal is not to have a lot of numbers. 
flashy as that is. The goal is to draw people into who the Lord is, to build them up in faith. If you lead, you serve. This is what Christ has shown us. To lead means to serve. To be God means to serve. And so if we have any leadership, any power, any authority that we have, use it to serve. Use it to bless. Verse 9. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. So Jesus made himself nothing, took the nature of a servant, was obedient to death, even death on a cross. What kind of death possible? Now, he is to be worshipped. He has the name that is above every name. So, the refrain in the song that that we're going to be looking at today, come and worship, come and worship. Worship Christ, the newborn King. That's the, the chorus, the refrain. We worship Him. He is worthy of our worship. And He will share His Father's throne, it says too. He has the name that is above every name. That means He has the same honor that God the Father has. So we worship Christ for who He is, and that is God. When He was born, He was still the Son of God. Even though He didn't come with big fireworks and and a big army or anything like that. There was some angels that announced his birth quite spectacularly to some shepherds. But other than that, his birth was pretty uneventful. And yet we are to come and to worship him because he is the Son of God. Even as an infant child, we worship him still. In Matthew 2, It says, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and they asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and we have come to worship him. And then on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshipped him. Even as a child, they worshipped him because he is God. He is the Son of God. So we worship him for who he is. He is God. That's mostly what we celebrate at Christmas time, who he is. And we also worship him for what he did. He had perfect obedience for us. He was obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's mostly what we celebrate during Lent, Good Friday and Easter. He had perfect obedience. He accomplished what we could never accomplish. He overcame death. And brought us salvation. So he is God. And he had perfect obedience. We worship him for both of these reasons. The person and the work of Christ. We both worship him for those reasons. And verse 10. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every knee should bow. Every knee hit the floor. Every knee will bow. It says in the the song, Seek the great desire of nations. Every knee shall then bow down. He's the desire of all nations. I can imagine, when I read this passage, I imagine him coming in the clouds of heaven with great power and glory, as he says. Great trumpet blast, you know, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. It's bright light from heaven coming and here's Christ descending. And he comes in great power and glory. And it's so overwhelming. It's a spectacle that everybody, whether they believe in God or not, whether they believe in Jesus or not, they can't help but just go... when he comes in great power and glory, our knees will not be able to keep themselves standing. So every knee, that means believers, atheists, enemies, and it means Irish and English too. 
Now, maybe that doesn't mean a lot to us today, but about 200 years ago, Irish and English, they hated each other. They hated each other. English <clears throat> invaded the Irish. They invaded the island of Ireland. They took it over and they kind of, you know, imposed their taxes and all this kind of stuff. And uh, they even passed laws that dissolved their parliament. And so it was, they, they dominated. You know, we had our American Revolution against the British crown. Well, they, they did not like the British crown either. There was one Irishman by the name of James Montgomery. There's a picture of him here. He was born in Scotland. He was born to an Irish Moravian missionary. And his parents were called to the mission field out in the West Indies. And they didn't really want to take him along because it was not going to be a very safe trip or a safe job. So they sent him to a boarding school in Ireland. And it was just a couple of years after that that his parents died, both of them, on the mission field. So they didn't last very long. So he joined a seminary, but he flunked out. He wasn't very good in school. He didn't do very well there. He was kind of a vagrant. He went from job to job. He was unemployed most of the time, mostly homeless, and just kind of stay with whoever he could find a place, somebody to stay with. He only had one interest, and that was writing. And so he would do a lot of writing on, on the side. And there was only one periodical who would publish anything he wrote. It was called the Sheffield Register. And so he would write, and the Sheffield Register would publish you know, his poems or stories and things like that. And then one day, the Sheffield Register, the editor of that publication, he uh, was run out of town because he said some things and published some things about the English. And so this Sheffield Register didn't have an editor anymore. Well, he decided that he would take over as editor. So he's now the editor the Sheffield Register, and he changed the name to Sheffield Iris. He assumed the leadership of that paper. And this paper was basically dedicated to one thing, Irish independence from England. And so all the stories, all the poems, everything that it published was dedicated to that end. Get the Brits out. Irish independence. And so he joined this cause. Let's get these Brits out. Let's have Irish independence. And along the same time, he joined the abolitionist movement against slavery. Let's cut out slavery. Let's end this. So he was an activist now. And he was publishing stories and poems and reports. And uh, he was thrown in prison twice for things that he wrote. There was one time that he published a poem that celebrated uh, the French Revolution, the fall of the, of the Bastille, if that means anything to you. And there was another time he went to jail because he uh, talked about some actions that the Sheffield police took when there was a demonstration, a protest. So, he was thrown into prison twice, and each time he came back, and he would still publish more and more. But then came December 24 of 1816. And he decided to do something different. It was Christmas Eve. He decided that he was going to do something different. He wasn't going to do politics this time. Instead of politics, he published a poem for Christmas and he called it The Nativity. And this poem talked about how there's a Savior that's born. And he's a savior for Irish and English. There's a line in it that said, gather all the nations to him. He even had a stanza that's not in our song anymore, but 
that was in his original poem that talked about repentance. It said, Sinners, wrung with true repentance, doomed for guilt to endless pains, justice now revokes your sentence, mercy calls you, break your chains. It kind of hits his abolitionist movement tendencies, as well as just the humility that comes from being in a political gridlock. So he fought the English with a pen, but it was an Englishman who picked up his poem. He spent his life arguing against English rule, arguing against the English, arguing against the English establishment. And his poem, people thought it was kind of nice, but it would have faded into history if it were not for somebody from the English establishment. His name was Henry Smart. He was a lawyer, and he became a musician. He had a really successful law career, and then he decided, you know, I don't really like law. My passion is music, so he decided to give himself to music. So after four years of legal career, he gave his time to study music. His dad was a music publisher also. And he was recognized as one of England's finest organists and accomplished composer. He served as an organist at many prominent churches. He was one of five organists asked to perform the Great Exhibition of 1851. And he was on a mission too. His mission was church music. He wanted beautiful music in English congregations. There was the Church of England... There were these other churches too, but the established Church of England was the Church of England, right? It's an Anglican church, kind of like the Episcopal Church. And it was this really high liturgy and, you know, very formal sort of worship. It's kind of funny how nothing really changes. They had worship wars back then, just like we do today. So Martin Luther had introduced congregational singing in Germany. Isaac Watts had written hundreds of hymns popularized hymn singing in the other English churches, but not the Church of England. Then Charles Wesley came, and he did the same thing in the Methodist Church. But the Anglican Church, they didn't really want to sing hymns. Many wanted nothing in worship except the simple chants that had been a part of worship for hundreds of years. They just wanted those chanting responses. But he wanted worship to be a joyful corporate experience, something where... The whole congregation is singing out joyfully. And that was his mission. And because he was somebody with a lot of energy and reputation, he was able to turn the tide, and he persuaded the Church of England to adopt hymn singing. And so he published a hymnal. He published a few of them, actually. And he had songbooks with harmonized melodies, and people demanded that... The Church of England used these new songbooks, and they did. And in these songbooks was a poem that he put to a tune, and he called it Angels from the Realms of Glory. He read Montgomery's poem, and he composed its tune, and he called the song Angels from the Realms of Glory. And so Angels from the Realms of Glory was part of the revival of singing in the Church of England. Smart went on to compose all kinds of cantatas, trios, duets, songs, opera, oratorios, organ music, all kinds of hymn tunes. His eyesight began to wane and he eventually died. He's also known for the the song, or the tune of the song actually, of Lead On, O King Eternal. And then Montgomery he eventually lost interest in the Irish Revolution. He decided that that really wasn't worth his time. So he devoted himself to missions and spreading God's word. And he ended up writing 400 hymns in his life too. The only one that we might recognize is Go to Dark Gethsemane. That's in our Psalter hymnal. The story of Angels from the Realms of Glory is a really cool story because it shows how divisive politics gives way to proclaiming the Savior for all nations. 
you had an Irishman who was dead set against English and the English rule. And he publishes one time, he decides he's not going to get political, he's going to just publish a poem for Christmas, and so he publishes it, and it talks about how there's a Savior for all nations. And of all people to pick up this poem was the people that he was against, an English establishment guy. And there is a Savior for all nations, English and Irish, American and North Korean. We have an, live in a day where there's divisive politics also. It seems like party lines divide people more than anything else. Even people who go to church. And there's all this gridlock in Washington and there's all this animosity and all these people are at each other's throats and nobody has anything good to say about anybody. We're in a time of political gridlock. A lot of political animosity. We live in a day of divisive politics. But we have a Savior who is over all nations, over all people, over people of any stripes, colors, beliefs, whatever. And one day, when this Savior comes again, it doesn't matter who you are, your knee is going to hit the ground and you are going to worship this Savior. And so we need to worship Him now. We need to worship Him now. Worship Him for who He is. He is God, even in the manger. And we need to worship Him for what He has done. He has saved us and brought salvation to every tribe, color, nation, language, tongue. And so I want to encourage you today, in our day of divisive politics, tell of Christ, the King of Kings, who demonstrated what being God means, means to serve, who demonstrated that God means blessing other people, who shows that politics nothing in the end and that the gospel means everything in the end let's bow our heads let's pray lord our god you are the god of all people of all politics doesn't matter who we are lord you are god we are here lord to acknowledge you today to give you our worship Lord, in this day of divisiveness, of different politics, different ideas, Lord, keep us, keep us front and center who you are, how you are the God over all people, all political affiliations, and that, Lord, every knee will bow to you. Give us this message, Lord, this message of salvation that you have brought, a Savior for all nations. Put that in our mouths, and Lord, make that our heart's desire. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.